This is No You Are Earth. And I am here with someone that you do not normally see. He's a kind of, in my mind, behind the scenes guy. Although I know that's <laughs> that isn't how I first met you. Chris Evans. This is Chris Evans. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, yes. Um... She's right, I am Chris Evans and uh, I am here as a steward, manager, owner of Applewood Permaculture Centre, um, which is our 20 acre small holding in North Herefordshire. And I'm a permaculture teacher and designer. A very, very experienced one. I met you 25 years ago. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, we used to work together in the permaculture garden at Glastonbury Festival. We haven't seen each other for about 25 years. And in, I mean, even then, you were already really experienced. You were one of the kind of key cool guys who was out there doing stuff. Would you like to say, you know, what it is that you were doing? And well, even back then, I, was, uh, I wasn't I was in Britain that, that often, actually, yeah. so the summertime every other year or so was was when I was there, because I was, um, and still am, working in Nepal right. with, uh, with permaculture projects out there, with, with uh, farmers and uh, in quite remote areas, and still doing that. Wow. Can't teach an old dog new tricks, you know. <laughs> um, can you, like, be a little bit more... <clears throat> Tell us what are these things you are actually doing in Nepal? Uh, well, I mean, in the word permaculture. Okay. Um, but uh, what that involves, uh, because Nepal is um, relatively remote um, and there's still a lot of farming goes on. I mean, take the Britain when we we're only 2% farmers. Yeah. In Nepal, maybe it's 90% farmers. Gosh, so, yeah. But the trend is. The trend is all changing you know there are people moving out and that yep. sort of thing and so I suppose I've got <clears throat> our projects there are aimed at creating communities where people don't want to leave oh, because there's such yeah. a lot of there's such a lot of migration out people are always looking for new things yes. or different things and they think oh their farming life their rural life isn't good enough yeah. for them so so what we're trying to do is demonstrate and and then train uh, in how to create sort of thriving communities which for them is actually quite easy because they're close to them anyway historically yes. and culturally um, but nevertheless you know actually there's more people moving out of those areas there despite that closeness with nature yeah and, and, and sort of natural systems than there are here it's like we've already wow. moved out yes you know, there's not many left in the countryside that's yeah why, but yeah, that is yeah. really interesting. I mean, I knew what you did. Um, I knew you were out there doing permaculture in Nepal, but I didn't realise that part of that was basically creating communities where people don't want to leave. And, I mean, how why, how do you create a community where someone doesn't want to leave? What is well, that? it's all about meeting your needs, isn't it? That's why you leave, is because yeah. you think you need something else or want, and there's a fine line between needs and wants. Yeah. But let's assume you have some pretty basic needs like food and security um, and um, society or social, uh, social uh, uh, culture. Um, so, so we sort of start from the bottom up in making, looking at food security or free, food sovereignty as we call it now. Um, so everything farming is about that, how to make it more productive, how yeah. to make it, make it less uh, hard labor, yeah. Or at least, if it is hard, if it is hard labor, that there's a, a reward for it, you know. So you get a, a fruit that you can that you can enjoy at the end of the day, um, instead of just thinking, oh, tomorrow's another day of toil. Can you give an example of what you mean in that? Composting, instance? fertility management. I mean, how to maintain fertility on steep and huge slopes yeah. that they have in the Himalayas there is a constant struggle Gosh. Um, and uh, you know normally they have very high labor inputs to do that so every member of the family all day long or every day of the week every week of the year grandma grandparents you know grandchildren they'd yeah. all be doing it and still they wouldn't be able to grow enough so what we're looking is is how to meet those needs how to identify where the where the niche is for for extra inputs or or 
changing the inputs is. And a lot of that is about natural resource management, so water management, uh, fertility management, and introducing things that they can use to make it easier. So like green manures and agroforestry and uh, diversification of diet and nutrition, reducing costs they have. So if they're getting sick, they're not able to work to, to contribute to that food security. So preventative health, so diet and hygiene, and um, how to be, yeah, just have uh, more out of less, I suppose. So be able to work more effectively, more efficiently with the resources that they have. Um, and at the same time, deal with some of the cultural limits that they have, like the caste system, uh, like um, a patriarchal society, like government corruption, and all those other levels. It's not just about farming. Uh, there's many other things as well. So, so, so the first thing is to identify what, where are the niches that improvements can be made, yeah. that costs can be cut, um, that productivity can be diversified and in, improved. Um, and you know, it might be that they haven't got a spring, uh, so they're having to carry their water for hours. So bring a spring, pipe it to the village, and all of a sudden they've saved two or three hours a day per household. Um, so, so you know, wow. simple things like that. Yeah. Um, but there's also very complex and interrelated things like the, the nutrient cycle and uh, trade and exchange and livelihoods and that sort of thing. So, with the permaculture program, you need to work at all of it because everything is connected. Yes. So it's food and food sovereignty. It's also um, health um, and preventative health. How to stay well, uh, but also how to cure yourself with using local resources, local herbs. And a lot of local knowledge <clears throat> is there for that. Um, and then we will look, work in education, so we work with schools. Wow, gosh. Um, but also ad adult literacy as well. So so we take it for granted here how, how many people can read. Mm. In Nepal, in remote areas, it might be as low as 10%, 6% of the women, and maybe 15 to 20% of the men might be literate, the rest not. Um, so, you know, just teaching someone to read and write is you wouldn't believe how how game changing that is, and that comes and within that, the whole the permaculture. Well, it comes it? within it because we use the the materials that we use to teach literacy are um, kind of um, farming books. So how to make nurseries and how to make compost right. and how to do this and so right. and so they're multifunctional in themselves. Wow. So and then after education, then we have livelihoods. So how do they? Uh, uh, use resources that are local um, for example uh, f fibers so nettles yeah hemp cotton um, and different things and how do you make soap um, and you know lemongrass oil and that sort of thing so all these resources are there just waiting to be processed and then marketed and so that's in a whole other stream as well is wow. And ultimately, that's what people leave to do is to earn money because mm. they can't earn it or they couldn't yes. historically earn it in the local village because there was no market, there yeah. was no economy. It was a subsistence economy. Yeah. And now they've been introduced to this uh, money economy called capitalism. Um, and, of course, it pulls them away from the village because they can't meet their needs for that in the village. So they go to Kathmandu or they go to the Gulf or... Yeah, you know, um, the Philippines or whatever, or Japan, if they can get the visas. Um, and so, if we can do that from their home resources, it's, it, it just cuts another reason why they want to leave or have to leave. Um, and so, yeah, so employment, health, education, food security. Um, what else do you need? Why would you want to leave? So otherwise, such beautiful places. Millions of tourists go there because they find it so beautiful. Yet the local people are sort of in this cycle of of, of drudgery and and hard work that doesn't even feed them for the year. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I knew that you were an experienced and knowledgeable <laughs> permaculture teacher, but honestly, like everything that you have just said to me, it's really quite sort of blown my mind I didn't know you know the extent of everything that you're covering and I feel I feel deeply grateful for your role 
in this. I really, I really thank you. Well, that's lovely to hear. Personally, you know, I went there in 1985 <clears throat> um, as a completely wet neck you know i thought i thought nepal was all buddhist and, and <laughs> abominable snowmen <laughs> yet is yeah um and you know it took me a couple of years to to get into it and find out what life was really about there yes uh, which also gave me a different perspective on, on this life in, in the yes. uk um and i suppose once i started doing that it seemed foolish to leave really as i was developing the uh, you know, observing and developing the the knowledge of the of the relationship of different things there. Yes. Um, then and and also at the same time the skills to problem solve. Yeah. Um, then it just made sense to carry on. Yeah. And so, so I have. So you still have still links now with very Nepal. Much. You were telling me <clears throat> yesterday you were on a, a Skype call with them to yeah. talk in Nepali. Yeah, yeah, you can do this about now, yeah. you know things but um you're also in england now and i mean english people or people from abroad what a resource we have in this man i mean wow about great knowledge and do you share that with people indeed i mean tell us that's what we do here at applewood is okay. uh we train yeah and we demonstrate yeah and uh, and we provide you know backup and support and resources and that sort of thing and funnily enough, that strategy came from Nepal that we've developed since the start. Ah. You, if you want change first, you need to demonstrate it. Yep. Uh, otherwise, people don't know. You can't write yeah. it on a whiteboard. No, it has to be real. What you want to be on a blackboard. Yeah. Um, it has to be real. It has to be out there um, uh, or in here in a way that you can demonstrate it. Yeah. So you can show, um, it was it said, be the change you want to see in the world. Well, we've that's you know that is what you see isn't it yeah um and the second part of that is then the training and the education yeah so how do you get to that demonstration you know if you have a garden that's a demonstration it says well, it's it doesn't just appear it needs to be created and designed um and so so we train in how that's done um and uh, so that's the second part so it, but it flows on. Demonstration is followed by training. And then the third part is, is if you see a garden and you've learned how it's made and how it's ma maintained, then it's like, oh, where do I get that plant or that seed? Or where can I read about that? Or mm. who else has knowledge about that? And so those resources um, are the third stage that enable people to then go and start doing it themselves. Mm. So, that, so was our, that was our strategy in Nepal for the, you know, what we've just been talking about. Yes. And and I've I've carried that here. Yes. Um, now we have our own land, because before we do courses always in other places and on other people's land, yes. other people's places. Uh, now we can do it here. And here we are on twenty acres of beautiful land in Shropshire. Are we Shropshire? Almost. Almost so in Shropshire. It's North Herefordshire. Yeah. The border's just a mile or so away. Yes. And the Welsh border is only a few miles that, in, yeah. in that way as well. And it feels as if we're in this kind of magical enclave of potential. It's lovely. It's a lovely place. It's got a lot of microclimate. It's very diverse. Um, it's quite sheltered. Uh, it's certainly private because mm. it's at the end of a no-through road. So yeah. there's no through traffic at all. Mm. Um, you're either coming here to do something, take something, give something or you're lost. Yes. yes. We can cater for all of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so so demonstration training and resource production. Yes, I, I will put um, links with this video so that people can get in contact with you and find out how to find out more. Um, so I asked you if there were three things that you, uh, no, I didn't ask you that. What I said was, is there any way that you would like to inspire and uplift the people watching this video and mm. what what would you say that people can do today right now to make a difference to step into that potential that we hold in our hearts of the world that we know we can create how do we do that Chris yep. I would say there are the three things that I would focus on 
One is to reduce your dependency on um, non-biological resources, i.e. fossil fuels. Yep. So do whatever you can, and obviously there's lots of things that's then, you know, a multitude of things you can do to reduce that, whether it's travel or, or heating or, or cooking or whatever, but reduce your dependency or your use of fossil fuels, number, yep. number one. Number two is involve yourself in food growing, mm -hmm. uh, which might not doesn't have to mean grow your own food. Okay. That's important because not everyone can or, or wants, wants to, to grow their own food, and to. that's fair enough. You know, yes. not, we're not saying you have to be a food grower; you have to have a garden yeah. in order to join in. You don't, but to be linked with it, so to be linked with like box schemes or yeah. your, a local organic farm or even non-organic, non as long as it's local. Yes, yes, and it's sometimes that a hard obviously choice. Links, that obviously links with the fossil fuels bit because if you're using local food, you're not, you're, you know, you're removing yourself from the need to fly, fly, fly them across the world. Yeah. Um, so that's number two. So yeah. involve yourself in food growing, either by doing it yourself or by linking with people that are mm -hmm. people groups, farms, whatever. Yeah. Um, and the third thing I would say then is to. Align yourself with like-minded people. <clears throat> so those who have the same vision, aims, um, want to do the same sort of things, go with them. Yes. Support and be supported yeah. with them, by them. Um, you know, share with them. Uh, because because it's community, isn't it? And yes. it's a social activity. Yes. So And you need people to support, to share, to, you know, throw ideas at um, and to develop things together yeah and then yeah yeah I mean um, it often f I know that people often feel quite isolated you know they have this impulse of doing you know those sort of things that you suggested mm. and but can sometimes just find that we live in a quite isolated sort of situation and what would what would you suggest how to kind of alleviate the isolation and burden of that. Get out when you can. I mean, it's very tempting to say, oh, social media. But actually, no. it's not about relying on that. No, no. Because, because that's false. Yeah. Um, it has its place. It has its uses. Um, but it's not the answer. Yeah. You're talking about physical contact. I'm talking about face, good old face-to-face -face yeah. um, contact. It, I yeah. mean, phone is one thing, you know, when you can hear someone's yeah. voice, uh, and and you can do that on social media as well. I know, um, but but you know, not to rely that on that as the as the only way of doing it. So yeah. it's that and face to face, get out, go to festivals, go to you know, look for um, and community gardens in the city. And skill up, invest yeah. in yourself, invest in your own in your own learning and education and well-being you yeah. know it's yeah, it's a I good mean, place it's the best place to invest actually start with yourself yeah um and then that when when you start to feel happier and more secure and more enriched in yourself that's going to spread it's that is so spread. key isn't it i mean that is the resilience that is the power that enables us to take those steps exactly thank you thank you thank you chris evans well, lovely to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> Good news, folks. <laughs>